So at MGC 2020, Dan Lucen, who runs the show, wants to have workshops on the Friday just before MGC. And he asked me if I would like to do a workshop. And I was like, well, of course, Dan, anything to help the Midwest Gaming Classic. So what I was thinking about doing is this, making a little single board computer badge. Now, I've seen these before at, uh, what is it, the Vintage Computer Festival. And of course, most big tech conferences have fancy electronic badges now. But I thought uh, doing something with like the Z80, the classic CPU that ran so many classic computers and arcade machines would be appropriate, especially at a classic gaming show. So what I want to do is design a single board Z80 computer that's fairly small. Here's it in reference to a soda can. I want to design that and it's going to be a workshop about you know, how computers work at a low level, how logic addressing works, and also making people somewhat comfortable with surface mount soldering. I'm going to force them to do some surface mount soldering. I'm there to help, but it's really not that hard because it's about controlling the solder and knowing how it behaves, not accuracy. I really need to drill that into people's heads. So this is my target uh, design. So what I'm gonna do in this video is basically show you what I've got so far and then open it up for uh, comments and suggestions because you know I have this basic design, but I want to know what people would like to see in it within reason. I want to keep the budget of the you know the bill of materials uh, no more than fifty dollars. All right, let's take a look at what I designed in Eagle. So here's the shape of the badge. I want to have uh, <laughs> two slots at the top so you could attach those uh, uh, clip lanyards. I like the lanyards where there's a clip at both end of the lanyard that gives your badge. Your Pretty decent shot of stain, straightforward. Also, we have a USB port coming out the top. I'm trying to keep this somewhat symmetrical. And this will be the USB traffic indicator lights. Two surface mount 32K SRAM modules. There's a couple reasons why I wanted to have these. First of all, first of all, 32K SRAM is a lot more common than 64K SRAM. I do have a few of these chips that I bought directly from China. And they would be easier to wire up, but I don't know. It actually takes up more space, even though there's only one of them. And I thought it'd be cool if people could, you know, actually see how RAM is addressed. Because that's one of the things I want to talk about in this, is how this logic stuff works. Speaking of which, over on the right, we have our surface mount Z80. I just think it's so crazy that you can still buy these things. And then over here on the right, I have a pair of quad NAND gates. I'm only using one right now, but I suspect I'll need the other one by the time everything is over. NAND and NOR are what they call universal gates. So you can make anything with them. So instead of confusing people with multiple uh, logic ICs, I'll just try to use the same IC over and over, just like they did on the uh, Apollo missions. Then up here we have a, what is it, MC6850 serial controller chip. Uh, these are obviously obsolete as all get out, but I have a pretty good supply of them. Takes up a lot of space on the board, but it greatly simplifies the serial interface. I hide the new stuff on the back of the board. So we have our uh, uh, AT Mega 32U4 back here. It's actually the same uh, package as the Z80. So that's good and bad because people might get them confused if they have poor eyesight. Right here, I have a pair of uh, 595 shift registers. You know, th they're good for everything. So what I'm doing with these is I'm using these to uh, load a 16-bit value serially off of the Atmel chip, and then these can drive the address bus. And then you see the address bus is pretty horizontal here. I think there is also some data in there as well. And the nice thing about these shift registers is they have an enable pin. So if I want to, I can make them go tri-state, which is important because I don't want them to affect the Z80's uh, address bus once the program is executed. Then down here at the bottom, I have a uh, 0.1 inch pitch, 36 pin header, this is basically going to be used for expansion. I also thought it'd be cool if a badge had a card edge connector at the bottom of it. <laughs> I might actually bump this up to a 40 pin. I'm not sure yet. Now let's take a look at the schematic view over here on the left, running the show, but not really. We have the Z80. We have an address bus and a data bus drawn off of that. Here we have the serial communication chip. I just have the data hooked up right now. Then we have our two RAM chips. Now, if you notice, they're basically all parallel. Right, everything has the same connection 
except for chip enable. So chip enable is active low. So I've created two signals, uh, low 32K and high 32K. And one thing I like to do is I'll just put a, uh, a slash in front of it, which, well, it's the same thing they do here. And they do that because you can't draw a line over characters in Eagle. Uh, oh, and up here we have the shift registers, which are attached to the data bus. And if you see here, there's, uh, well, they call it G, but that, that's basically enable. And I believe it's active low. So if we pull G high, that will make the outputs of the shift registers go tri-state and not affect the Z80 negatively. That's actually a really important thing, especially when we're loading the Z80. Uh, we have to make sure the bus is actually clear. And there's a, there's a way to do that, which we'll get to later. Uh, over here, this is the expansion port. Uh, I, actually, I actually just drew this manually. Uh, and then over here, I haven't hooked everything up yet, but this is the, uh, the microcontroller, right? There is some gotchas uh, if you're using the Arduino Leonardo version of it. I want to do that because that's the easiest for people to use, including myself. However, uh, one of the gotchas is it has these um, uh, USB traffic indicator lights, and that's built into the uh, Arduino core itself. And the problem with that is uh, it prevents you from using an entire port. See how we have PB0 to PB7, PD0 to PD7. Those are really the only two complete ports we have, but each one has an indicator light on it, which means if we were to use either one of those for the data bus, uh, any sort of traffic, USB traffic on the Arduino would mess up the Z80's data bus. We could do buffers, but that's just too much work. <laughs> I wanna keep this as few parts as possible. So what I did was uh, right here, you see this is the data bus and I split it up. So I put four of the bits on the top of port F and the other four bits on the top of port B. It'll make it a little slower to load it. We can't just load the whole port. We'll have to load two ports and also change the data direction register on two ports. Again, not a really big deal in the grand scheme of things. It'll still load quite quickly. And then we have, uh, we want to use the serial TXRX because we can use that to talk to the serial chip. It'd be really ideal if we could actually use the uh, USB portion of this and make this into some sort of crude mass storage device. So you could just like click and drag uh, bin files to it and then store them on the EEPROM. You can also store them in the flash of the Arduino Leonardo as well. This is the NAND gate we talked about. In the proto board version of this, I used ORs and NOTs but I wanted to simplify it. So let's talk about what's going on here. So ultimately we have two RAM chips, but only one can be active at a time. So we have a low 32K and a high 32K, and that's an active low signal, right? So if it's a zero, that means the chip is active. If it's a one, the chip just ignores everything on its bus. So over here, uh, the two most important things to think about is the A15 line and mem request, right? So mem request is when the Z80 wants to talk to its, well, memory, not the IO bus. So that will go low when it's trying to access anything in its 64K main program space, which could be a ROM or a RAM. So here's what we're gonna do. So we're gonna take A15. So let's say A15 is a zero. That means it's trying to access the first 32K of memory. So that's zero. Well, it would go into here and become a one, right? And then that one would come over here to this AND gate. And if mem request is low, it becomes a one. So in that case, you got two ones going into this AND gate, which is a positive result. But since it's an AND, it outputs a zero instead, and boom, you've activated the lower 32K, right? Uh, same thing, let's say A15 is a one, which means it's trying to access the upper 32K. So this one would out output a one, which would be, you know, not active. So you've got a one here. You can just take that directly into this NAND gate along with the inverted zero from mem request and it activates the high 32K. So we're just using two of the NANDs as straight inverters. See how their inputs are tied together? But you know, that's why it's a universal gate. So basically what would normally take two integrated logic chips we can do with one because we're using NAND gates. Well, that's an overview of the circuit. Now let's take a look at the proto board I wired up. Okay, let's go over this. We have an Arduino Leonardo there, and we have a bunch of jumper wires going from it to our Z80 board. Here we have the two 32K RAM chips. If you'll note, I dead bugged them just to be really lazy because everything on the chips is parallel except for the output enable. So see how this one's output enable line is going out separately? 
very lazy. But I've got a ton of those RAM chips, so I don't care. Right next to that, we have our two 595 shift registers, so the Arduino can drive the address bus if it wishes. I have seen people do this with counters, but if we just do this, we can basically jump to any memory address we want, which means you could uh, stop the Z80 during a program and analyze or change <laughs> the uh, memory it's addressing. Then down here, we have an OR gate and a NOT gate. I might have those switched up. Again, we can do this with a single NAND, but I just wired it up with a NOR and a NOT because I, I wasn't being clever enough when I, when I made this breadboard. Uh, here we have an oscillator. It's about 7.3 megahertz. Uh, people use this frequency because it divides down into 115200, which is a very common uh, serial bus frequency. Uh, here's the Z80, of course. This is a uh, you know old school uh, DIP40 package. I like to collect these off of like old arcade machines, so I have a good number of these, even though I want to use a surface mount one for the actual project. And here is the uh, Motorola serial chip, and that's going into a standard. FTDI to USB connector going back to the computer. So we have uh, two USB connectors on this right now. We have what's programming the Arduino and then we have the uh, the USB connector for the FTDI. Um, in the actual project, we'll also be using the Arduino as the serial to USB converter. So it'll just be a single USB connection, which should also be sufficient for power. This is actually running off of the uh, USB bus. It's a little pushing it to the limit one more time, but whatever, it'll be all right. On the underside, try not to gasp. I know this looks a bit ridiculous, but I can actually do this in maybe like three or four hours, which is a lot faster than waiting for PCBs to arrive, and therefore I know it all works. So I've got everything labeled over here. It should all work. We're going to use bus request to load the RAM. In an effort to see how boring I can make this video, let's go over the code. So this is being uh, done for the Arduino Leonardo, which is basically uh, a Uno that has USB support. It's got a little bit more RAM. Uh, so we have uh, memory defined. So I've, I'm just using Grant Searle's uh, classic uh, basic bootloader example. So I actually used a Linux script to uh, take a hex file and turn it into char definition for C. All right, so we're going to do some defines, and these are using the Arduino pin defines. Uh, we got the Z80 reset, so we can control that. Mem request, write, read, a bus request, and bus acknowledge. That's important. An IO request. IO request, we're not actually using it, but we need to make sure it's tri-state. That was actually something that, that uh, screwed me up before. Uh, latch is to load the shift registers, and shift enable is uh, to enable them. Uh, we, we could improve this later on, but we probably are going to be pretty tight on I.O. The thing is, though, if you could get a bigger microcontroller that would have enough I.O. that you wouldn't even need the shift registers, but it's going to be more expensive, and also it's going to have finer pitch pins that people would not be comfortable soldering. I mean, they're already not going to be comfortable, but they'd be more uncomfortable, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to reset the Z80. Uh, then we're going to basically... Well, we're going to leave everything tri-state. So on a microcontroller, to make something tri-state, you just turn it into an input. So basically, you're sensing what's on the data line, but you're not affecting it. And we're going to disable pull-ups on the microcontroller. Uh, so what happens is if you have something as an input, most microcontrollers, you can select if there's an internal pull-up, which means there's a, you know, I don't know, 5 to 10K resistor basically attached to uh, VCC. Uh, we want to disable that because we do not want to affect the bus in a negative way. We want it to be as pure tri-state as possible. Uh, okay, we're going to begin spy and then set it up. That's we're just going to use spy to load. Well, we're actually going to do a couple things with it, but right now we're using it to load the shift registers. Uh, basically, we're just going to wait for a character on the serial bus before we start anything, since we don't have a, a button. And so the first thing we're going to do is request the bus. Here is the classic Z80 pinout. Here is the classic Z80 pinout. Now I was falsely under the assumption that you could just hold the Z80 and reset and everything would be tri-state, meaning the Z80 would not affect the bus. And it was true, <laughs> the data bus and the address bus does go tri-state when you hold down reset, but <laughs> read and write do not. So that was a little strange. So you actually have to do a bus request even if you're resetting the CPU. And I didn't realize that, and I actually found the answer on an article about programming the uh, Sega Genesis of all things, because it has a Z80 along with the 68000. So we actually have to keep that in mind when we're doing this. So the first thing we're going to do is request the bus. 
So let's go down to that function. Requesting Z80 bus. So we're going to pull bus request low, and that's this over here. And then we're going to wait for the Z80 to acknowledge that it's done it. It will pull bus acknowledge low. So while bus acknowledge is one, we're just going to wait. And then once it has changed, we'll say, OK, it's been acknowledged. And then we can continue on. Uh, so the Z80 will finish doing whatever instruction it is doing when it gets that request. And then once that instruction is over, then it will acknowledge the request and just sit there and wait for you to release the bus acknowledge line. All right, what's next? Uh, OK, load RAM. <laughs> so I was having some trouble with this as well. I was trying to overthink it, and then I realized that it was just a uh, uh, interface problem with the, with the serial chip. But this is actually pretty simple. So we're going to go take control of memory and assert bus. So let's look, what, look at that. Uh, memory control, uh, 0, 1. And I'm doing this kind of uh, clunky donkey. So I'm using the uh, Arduino version of it. So I'm setting it high, and then I'm setting it as an output. Right? And the reason I'm setting it high first is so when it switches mode, it'll already have a 1 on the bus and not trigger anything. right? And then if we're releasing control of memory, we put a zero there to make sure that the pull-up is disabled, even though we disabled them globally. You just never know. And then we make it an input. So we do that for uh, each one of these. And we also disable the shift registers by putting a one there. The other thing that we do is we set the um, data to out. So, okay, so this is how you do it when you're not using the Arduino. This is how you really do it. Use a data direction register, and I'm oring in the top four bits, which is basically makes it one and then the top four bits of the F port. Because as we talked about earlier, we're using the top four bits of two separate ports to assert the data. Here is the data sheet for the RAM. This isn't the exact RAM chip I'm using in the build. This is the one I'm using in my prototype. Uh, okay, let's look at the stuff. Blah, 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 blah. Where's the timing waveforms? That's all we care about. Oh, well, here's the, the time, but it's all in nanoseconds, so we're not going remotely that fast, so we don't really need to worry about it. Ah, here we go. Uh, well, we need a write cycle first. Okay, write cycle. Okay, so this is a write cycle. Uh, write enable controlled is what we're doing. Okay, so first we assert the address on the bus. Then we do a chip select, which in our case will be the mem request. Then write enable goes low. Then we assert our data, and then write enable goes high. So what it's probably doing on the chip is actually probably latching it when write enable goes high again. But these diagrams show you the, uh, you know, it shows you how long you need to have data active for, for it to actually work. And so it's really not about the time because we're going fairly slowly. It's more about the order in which you do it. So, all right, set address. Okay, we did that. Select the RAM. Did that. Assert data. Okay, so I'm doing this a little bit before, <laughs> but whatever. Strobe the right, so we're just going to go low and then high, and then disable memory. And then we're going to do that for payload size, which is uh, 8,192. Then we are going to check the RAM. So let's go over here and go to the read cycle. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to load uh, check byte from memory. And again, that's coming from here. Oh, and uh, so I have a constant int8 payload prog mem. See how I've got that there? The reason I'm doing that is so this is actually part of flash memory, not RAM. Otherwise, well, you'd be out of RAM. <laughs> so when you access it, you need to do program read byte near uh, payload, which is what the variable is called. Well, not the variable, the section of memory. So yeah, that's pretty useful. You just want to have a, a bunch of data in memory. All right, so anyway, we get the byte so we can compare it. We assert the address right here. There we go. We activate the memory, OK, and then we do read. So read is going to control the output enable pin on the memory. So basically, you know, you've selected the chip. And so if output enable is low, that means the, the memory chip will assert its data, output enable. All right, so we're going to do the read, and then we're going to read the byte from the bus of the RAM. And then we're going to pull read high to uh, finish the cycle. And then we're going to check it, and you know that's just for debugging. Anyway, then we're going to deselect the RAM. We probably don't really need to do that, but I just prefer to do the whole cycle. And then again, we'll do that for the whole payload size, and it will report how many errors there are, if any. All right, then once that's done, we're going to go to start Z80, which is right here. So we're going to release 
the memory. So basically we're gonna put all our controls at high state, including the data bus, which is what that function does. We're gonna disable our shift registers so they don't affect the bus. Then we're going to, uh, well here, so how, see how I have pin mode Z80 reset output? So it's already set to one. So if I turn that into an output, that means the, <laughs> the Arduino is controlling that pin to make it go to uh, a zero. Then we wait one milliseconds. Then we release the bus, this is the important thing, and then we release reset. So what we do is we just turn reset on the Arduino side into an input. And since there's a pull up in the circuit, that means it will come out of reset and allow the Z80 to run. That also means we can just push the reset button on the Z80 without overdriving any, any of the IO. Okay, let's test it. We'll get the Arduino serial terminal here, which we have to put a character into for it to start. I'm going to use PuTTY to attach to the serial port. Uh, interesting to note, uh, some programs, like, you know, if you use this serial terminal, it'll only send the characters after you press enter, whereas PuTTY will send characters as soon as you enter them, which is more appropriate for, like, obviously a Linux server or what we're about to do with the Z80. So just something to keep in mind. Like, if I type an A here, I'm going to have to push return to send it, and this will actually activate everything. Uh, yeah, so here we go. Okay, zero errors, resetting Z80, and right over here, here we go. Yes, Grant Searle's classic Z80. I think he took his page down. Mm, anyway, uh, let's do cold start, which means it's going to erase the RAM. Memory top, figure it out yourself. There it is. Print. Hello world. Go to 10, run. There it is. Control C to stop, kind of like Linux. Uh, here's something of note, because this is a terminal, remember. So if I type something wrong, like go sub 10, if I push backspace on my keyboard, it's going to, well, it's going to go back, but it's actually printing back the characters that I just typed. So what is actually, I erased them, even though it didn't look like I did, I kind of did. So what one trick you can do is, um, let's see, go sub no, I don't want to do that. So I can go Control H on my keyboard. And if you look at the ASCII table, Control H is backspace. It's eight in ASCII. See? And then I can change that. Ten. All right. And actually, let's see. <laughs> let's go back to the Arduino thing. Let's reload basic. All right, so it's reloaded now. It only affected the first 8K of memory, so my program should still be there. Hey, look at that. Uh, because, of course, uh, even though the first 8K is RAM, which is holding the basic program itself, it's not going to uh, look at its own memory space when it's trying to figure out how much free space there is. Although I'm sure the stack at the top of memory probably was changed. Let's cost out some parts. I'm gonna remove the FTDI cable. And then this wire I have going to the Arduino's standard TXRX over there. Let's see, so that means it's going to be this, which means, of course, it has to flip around because why wouldn't it? <clears throat> so this will feed the output of the serial chip directly into the standard hardware UART of the Arduino. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this uh, ATmega32U4 is a USB device. So in the Arduino code, we can actually create two different serial devices. So the first one, we just go serial begin, which is the normal way. But on the Leonardo, that's the USB port. So it's going to be USB serial. OK, let's make serial loop. Sounds delicious. OK, if. Serial available, that's from the USB port. Then serial one, which is to the Z80, write serial read. So it's going to read a byte from the USB port and send it over the port to the Z80. Conversely, if serial one available, that is, if something's coming in from the Z80, <laughs> serial 
write, that is, we're going to write to the USB port, serial read, oh, I'm sorry, serial one read. So if data is coming in for the USB port, write it to the Z80. If data is coming from the Z80, write it to the USB port. So then after we start up the Z80, we'll just uh, wall one. Serial loop. I flashed the new code to the Arduino. Let's open PuTTY, but again, it's going to be port 7 this time because it's the Arduino port. Let's give it a character. There we go, just like that. Cold start. All right. So we're just basically exchanging the USB and UART characters through the Arduino Leonardo. So what you could do, uh, well, and what I probably will do, is in the serial loop, you know, the thing that just sits there and exchanges data, you could check for control commands. Like you could use some control ASCII commands that you wouldn't use for anything else, and that could possibly jump you out of that loop so you could control things with the Arduino. So it's not like we're trapped in here forever. It should be pretty, uh, pretty easy to jump out and do things. But for now, uh, yeah. That way we don't need the extra serial chip. I mean, we already have the extravagance of the MC68B50. Um, we, we could access the Arduino as a device directly with the Z80, but that would complicate things. It would also slow down things. It's much easier just to slap in that old school serial chip. So I would suggest that people that take this workshop bring a laptop that has PuTTY pre-installed. That way they'll be able to talk to their single board computer. There are some other things I'd like to add, but you know, this is the easiest way to talk to it. Now I talked about how I wanted this to be a badge. And of course a badge has to do something so people look at it and think it's cool. And originally I was gonna have like eight LED lights for like Cylon lights, but that would actually require adding an IO port, which would kind of take up some space. Again, I want this to be something people could solder up in like three to four hours, preferably, you know, three. So what I was thinking was using one of these uh, OLED spy modules. Uh, this screen is very much like what you find in the RG Boy. Oh, by the way, I am I am working on a game for RG Boy. It's called Garbage Miner 2049er. It's a uh, basically a uh, Boulder Dash clone. Here, I can show you. Probably have something in EEPROM. Oh, yeah. So it's got a built-in editor, too. Let's see, test level. So basically, you can design the levels with the game system itself. Anyway, uh, I've been working on this slowly for a year. So eventually, I have that released. I'll make a video about that, too. Anyway, yes. So it's a screen very much like that. And uh, there's a pretty standard library you can use from Adafruit. I think it's the uh, SSD 1306 is what the device is actually called. And you can buy these modules off Amazon for, oh, I don't know, 6 to $10. So I think I'm probably going to include that in the bomb and I'll put it basically right there. So what I'll do is I'll write a little serial terminal program for this. So every character that the Arduino is trying to write back to the putty window, it will also display here, right? So in that case, if you had just this and attached a keyboard, then you wouldn't need an external computer at all. And also, if you get some sort of like a track mode going or a basic program, you could have it running on this screen as you wear it as a badge. Obviously, you need a power supply of some sort, but you know, you could just have like a, you know, phone charging brick in your pocket and then have a cable running up here. Here's a block diagram of what I've done so far. All right, so we have our microcontroller. It does USB serial, it loads the RAM, and it controls spy devices, talks to your computer here. Then it's going to have a couple of spy devices attached to it. The 16-bit shift register that we used to create a 16-bit data. The 16-bit, it's got a couple of uh, spy devices attached to it. 16-bit shift register, which creates the memory address. Uh, that OLED display I talked about. And possibly an EEPROM. So if we put those all in the same spy bus, we'll save a lot of I.O. So on the microcontroller side, it's a shift register that drives the RAM address and the data lines are directly connected as we discussed. The RAM is connected to the Z80 in a fairly normal fashion. 
The Z80 is connected to the MC6850 serial adapter, and that transmits data back and forth to the standard UART of the microcontroller, which then translates that into USB for the computer. So that's basically what we have so far. So a big reason I made this video was because I wanted to, you know, show you guys what I was working on and also, you know, ask you what you think, like, what would you add to this? Um, you know, what other features should it have? Should it have like a battery backup for the RAM? Should there be a RC 2014 expansion port? I don't know if that would fit, but we could try a uh, real time clock maybe some different headers. Should I use an SD card instead of an EEPROM? Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, get some feedback on what you think of it so far and what you think I should add. I think I am going to run out of I.O. pretty quick on this microcontroller, so I'm going to have to do some creative solutions about that. I'll probably use like a uh, 138 3-8 multiplexer to address some of these things more elegantly. But uh, so far, so good. And the basic idea is... You know, you can basically load the RAM with whatever you want and then have the Z80 execute it. So you could have like drag and drop binary file support so you don't even have to worry about burning EEPROMs. And also by having all of the address space be RAM, it would make it easier to load CPM, that operating system, because that requires RAM at uh, address zero, which normally is where ROMs are on systems like this because the Z80 uh, uh, reset vector is zero, zero, zero. And it would also, and having 64K of straight RAM, no ROM, makes it easier to put CPM on this thing because CPM, the operating system, requires RAM at the beginning of memory, but that's usually where the Z80 puts its ROM because the Z80's reset vector is at zero as opposed to like the 6502 where it is at the end of memory. All right, so yeah, leave me some comments below as to what you think I should add to this. Remember, it has to fit in that 2.5 inch by 2.5 inch badge size. And uh, it's beginning of February right now. MGC is the beginning of April. So I need to have this done and designed by the end of February. So I have at least a month to get test PCBs, make sure they work and then order more PCBs for the workshop. I'm thinking like probably no more than 10 people. And about three hours on that Friday before MGC, that should give us enough time Again, I, I want to make sure everyone walks out of there with a badge. Uh, I think we're aiming for a $75 cost, which covers the room and these parts. So that's actually a pretty good price for a single board computer. And if you do have trouble soldering, of course, we'll help you. All right. So, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments below. And I guess we'll see you guys in the next video. I'll do a follow-up once I have this designed. And then we'll see you at MGC. Thanks for watching.